That's how it's no. I see how you're operating. Okay, the uh, the meeting of the Ascension Parish Zoning Commission, so September 11, 2013, will now come to order. Uh, Madam Secretary, please note that all members are in attendance. Uh, our staff has introduced themselves with the exception of you, Patrice, so if you would... Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, agenda item number five, approval of the minutes uh, of the August 14th zoning meeting. What's your pleasure? So moved, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Nizo moves. Mr. Bishop seconds. Any objection? The minutes stand approved. Uh, item number six, Chairman's comments. Uh, I have no comments at this time. Item number seven is a public hearing to amend the Ascension Parish Development Code for recommendation for approval or denial to the Ascension Parish Council. A, zoning review ID 234913, tracks numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6, and Evan Hall Sugar Cooperative property for Evan Hall Sugar Cooperative Incorporated. Um, Mr. <coughs> Thibault, welcome. Thank you. Uh, Charles Thibault, uh, 3599, Highway 405. Don't. Okay. Uh, just to give you all some background on this, as you know, this has been a, a sugar mill site for over 100 years. Mm -hmm. uh, I was really unaware that it was zoned uh, light industrial. Uh, we have an interest that wants to come in uh, that I think will be beneficial to the parish and to the uh, sugar industry. Uh, they want to take bag ass, which is the pulp left over from sugar cane, and make a charcoal type item with it. They burn it in the absence of in the absence of oxygen and make charcoal out of it. And it comes in a little pellet form. Uh, it burns cleaner than coal. It kind of looks like coal except it's pelletized. Um, it has a higher BTU per pound than, than coal does. It burns cleaner. Can it easily be handled? It will withstand weather. They could put it outside. One of their biggest customers will be uh, the new facility at, at Ormet, Impala. What Impala does there is they, they blend different uh, grades of coal for their customers. And they can use this to increase their fuel value of coal. And um, it sounds like a good deal to me. So. Uh, I was told that they needed uh, heavy industrial zoning on that. Uh, and that's why we, before you, uh, they'll have a boiler there and so forth. Basically the same operation that we had, um, except uh, no emissions. We had a lot of water emissions, uh, which we had it to impound. They won't have any of that. And it's a clean operation. The way it will benefit the parish is that not only can they do this with bag ass, but they can do it with wood waste. If we would have, God forbid, another storm, and we had a lot, a lot of wood waste to get rid of, they can take it and make it into charcoal pelletized. It would save a lot of money for the parish. I've been told a tremendous amount of money parish if we can get this in our parish. Yeah. So it's a win-win all the way around and we're not looking at any kind of emissions, any kind of noise, any kind of particulates, anything like that. Uh, so it's it's a good deal. Do you think I, I, an indication of how many jobs <coughs> might be created with this? About 50 jobs. Uh, that does not include uh, probably truck drivers and people like that. Uh, they'll be getting bag ass from as far as way as over on the test possible. Mm -hmm. Are they planning on using the facility as it is now? Uh, no. Where it's at? They're going to relocate or build there? Or? They're going to they're going to build a facility there. Okay. So the, uh, the house thing will be removed or? It's already removed. Okay. You, Paul, you haven't been by there. Well, I'm on this side. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a while since I've been down there. There is another side of this parish. Right. <laughs> well, I, I did that for 30-something years. 
I would invite y'all to come visit the West Bank. So are they going to uh, use natural for gas? For any reason. They're using natural gas for? No, to... they're using the bagasse itself. Okay. Once they get going, they, uh, just like a sugar mill, a sugar mill uses bagasse uh -huh. to, for its energy. Uh, but to get it going uh, and to get that fuel volume going, uh, they use natural gas. And we already have a, a natural gas presence there mm -hmm. because of the sugar mill. And the other key is that we have rail spurs there. So they can um, uh, they can use the rail, although I would think they're not going to use very much rail. Oh, they, I mean, I'm, I have to apologize. I haven't visited the sugar house in a long time either, uh, although I can remember in my college days working there. And you did. Uh, yes. Uh, <laughs> Uh, in the neighborhood, any neighbors there that are going to be impacted by this? No, I wouldn't think so. Not not any more than what the sugar house was. Uh, maybe a slight noise. Um, there'll be less of the particulate matter um, in the air than there was with the sugar house, mm -hmm. and that wasn't very much. And. Um, well, this is not a new process. This is something a company has It's a new in. process. It is? But mm -hmm. it's a proven process. Okay. They, they brought some of the material to me and showed me. Okay. I mean, they're operating somewhere else besides? They operate in Europe. Okay. And they have a, a, a pilot plant of all places up in Iowa somewhere. Okay. And they use that. We, um, we just sent them a bunch of bad gas up there to uh, do some additional testing. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to tell you all how lucky you all are. The last time I came to a zoning meeting was quite a long time ago and was across the way there. And the room was packed and we weren't on television and there were two police officers in there <laughs> <laughs> with loaded guns. Uh, so you all really got it good over here, man. <laughs> The staff has recommended a 200 foot buffer. Do you, mm -hmm. you have any issues with that? Any problems with that? So, no. Like, no. no. Mm -hmm. yeah. okay. I don't think it would be needed, but whatever. Purpose. Okay. Any other questions, comments? Uh, we need to open a public hearing for this. Uh, no problem. Any cards? Oh. I just want to say that what it, what it is is that 200 feet is transition, basically. Tra oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Talking uh -oh. old school. Uh, medium medium industry is what it would be around there. All right. Okay. So, yes, sir. All right. And I and think there's a map that's percent. included in the handout that, that shows that, uh, that uh, 200 around the property. That's the new handout. Okay. Good. All right. So we will open the public hearing. Do we have any cards? No others? Okay, then we will close the public hearing. Uh, any other questions, discussions? Uh, I'll entertain a motion. I'll make the motion that we approve. Mr. Lizo moves. Mr. Uh, Bishop seconds. Any objection? Okay, then we will, it passes, and we will recommend that to the council. Great. Thank you. Uh, next item is B, Ordinance DC 13-9B, Revisions to the Development Code Zoning Table Subdivision. Related to the Unified Land Development Code, and this is uh, uh, companion to what we did uh, in uh, planning, correct? Yes, sir. These tables are part of the Development Code and need to be approved by the Zoning Commission. I just wanted to point out a few changes from the last time that we looked at this. We added the words minimum lot width frontage, so minimum, so that the understanding was that you could do more than those minimums, but the minimum is that. Um, one of the builders, uh, developers that I talked with was really interested in raising the percentage for the 60 and 70 foot lots. Originally I had them 60 foot lots were 60 percent, 70 foot lots were 70 percent. I didn't think it was a deal breaker to, to appease the, the wish that he had to up those percentages and so I, I changed those as well. Under D, housing types, the minimum lot area. For whatever reason, when I did my math, I had used a different depth for that one particular lot width. And when they pointed out that it was really just a math equation, I, I, I went ahead and made a match. So all of them are using the same depth. Um, and then front setbacks, 
I reduced them, um, I believe, from 25 to 20 on the B and C types and from 20 to 15 on the F and H. And the thought with F and H with a 15-foot front is that if that's a rear load alley product, you're not needing to park a car in front of the house, and that house could, in theory, push closer to the street. And so that's why I did that. Um, I added the notes for those two uh, types being rear load alley. And then on the bottom, footnotes two and three, for two, I added the word accessory structure in front of setback lines. So you understand that um, at the end, the right side of the table, I'm allowing accessory structures to get closer to the property lines uh, via their setbacks. And I just want the footnote to acknowledge that the accessory structure must meet the accessory structure setbacks. Kind of redundant, but he wanted them in there, and so I added those words. And then item three, all setbacks are measured from the eave building overhang. And that's something Mr. Domain pointed out to me is that we don't measure setbacks to the foundation. It's measured to the eave. And just to clarify that in the footnotes would, would help. So this is the point when I think as this body, we should discuss the side setbacks. And do we want to push the narrower side setbacks to the council and let them decide if they want them larger? Or do we push the larger side setbacks and have some people come and argue that they would like them smaller? And I'm really looking for the commission to decide how do we want to move forward? So we're just looking for a starting point. I mean, the, the, for the council, we're looking for a starting point for them. Correct. Okay. Ricky, how do we handle the setback now in something like a zero lot line neighborhood? I live in a zero lot line neighborhood, and I know that we can build up against the lot with a five foot maintenance over to right. one side. But I mean, that's not stop. I mean, I think there's a setback on one side of the right um, zero lot line. I mean, that's that seems like it wasn't a concern before. And now all of a sudden, it's a concern that we need more space because of fire? Zero lot lines would have gone away a number of years ago had the council gotten their wish. They, they reduced them down to only allow them in commercial districts. Um, that doesn't take away the fact that they have concern over zero lot okay. lines. They've just limited them to the commercial districts. They used to be allowed everywhere. I think RM3 used to allow zero lot lines. So, you know, the concern that I've heard from very particular councilmen is as the lots get narrower, the fear of fire jumping from house to house is greater because of the volunteer fire service and in some parts of the parish where that response time may be longer. I guess my thought on that is I, I would think it would, <clears throat> I'd, I'd be more in favor of giving them the smaller and letting them make the decision as to how big they want them, if they're going to make the decision, rather than put a number on them that's larger and then have them maybe even go larger. You know, give them the leeway to make the larger steps that they wanted. I would simply argue make them smaller, and the day after we have one of these fire events where fire has jumped from structure to structure, we put an ordinance where we make them bigger. But, I mean... <laughs> I think well, to respond to something that hasn't happened yet is kind of yeah, acting in fear. Yeah. I'm sure they're getting it from good sources. I mean, I'm sure they've got. And, and I'm sure if we make them smaller, they're probably going to look at that real hard when they do decide to to act on this. Because uh, I listened to some of the previous <coughs> discussions they've had, and and they seem to be leaning more toward the larger sizes. So I would kind of leave that to their discretion. Yeah, I have a question about the process. Um, and when we make a recommendation to the council, they have the authority to amend it. I mean, they don't have to come back to us with, with that. Mm -hmm. So they can amend it there and just pass it, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes, sir. A minor thing, but I, I think uh, you got a spelling error on separation. What? <laughs> what? <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. Good catch. My English teacher would be so proud. <laughs> 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 Ricky, there was a, a discussion earlier about on the as the lots get larger, the side setback gets larger um, proportionally, not, uh, maybe not proportionally larger, but for the very largest lots, 110 foot wide lots, the side setback is 15 feet on either on each side. Yes, sir. Okay, and then um, and then for a, a 
a lot that's uh, 20 feet narrower, it's um, 10 feet on each, each side. So it's um, it goes from 30 feet to 20 feet. Yes, sir. Okay. Um, what was the argument against that? Was it was the argument there's too much that's too much space between houses? <laughs> now, that's the minimum. That that's the minimum, right? I mean, you can have obviously you can have. I, I know on one side of my house I have about 12 feet to the property line, and on the other side I have quite a lot more. Right. These are always minimums. Yeah. And the thought when I was putting the table together was, as the lots get smaller, you know, and once again I would still argue I like five foot sides. As they get bigger, you still want to maintain some visual separation. And a five-foot side yard on an 80-foot wide lot, you've got gigantic houses that are right next to each other. You want to step them back a little bit so they're, it sort of feels the same as you're driving down that street, as you're living in that community. So that's the idea. Is you, you sort of, as the lots get bigger, you step the setbacks in so they don't completely fill. I mean, I could take you to subdivisions in West Palm Beach in Miami where, I mean, it's a 3,000 square foot house, yeah. two and a half feet off the property line. The next one's right there, and you know they're pack them and stack them. That's not what we're looking well, for. I, you know, I understand the argument when the lot's small. You are it, it does give you more <clears throat> an architectural challenge to get a house on a on a, a much smaller lot. But the larger lots, I, I really don't see an issue with that. It seems like there's plenty of. I could be proven wrong, but it seems like there's plenty of space to be a, build a big house. Well, Ricky, something like these, like a 75, a 70. Why, 70 foot wide lot. I mean, you're talking about having what a seven and a half foot side set back. You jump up to 10 foot at a 80 foot wide lot, like something like a shed that you'd want to put on your lot in the back. You're pushing somebody third. How far off the back? On C. 20 foot on the rear and, and 10 foot. I mean, that's taking away a lot that someone could maybe put up like a, well, that's a, a shop or a shed. What's that? That's the primary structure's rear setback. Is that, uh, I, and I guess that's kind of what I'm, at, I'm getting to. I mean, if you want to put up a shop or a shed, would you be feet. limited to that with that? This is a accessory structure, 10 feet, except for the largest lot, 12 and Right. I mean, we've, we've oh, okay. maxed out your accessory structure to 1,000 square feet. So if you're going to build a 999 square foot accessory structure, that can get to 10 foot from the rear and 5 foot from the sides on that lot you're talking about. Okay. I'm doing that too. Other questions? Okay. Oh, wait, are we are we talking about reducing the, the uh, <coughs> side width on uh, the smallest lots or not? Which well, that, we that would come that when, we, when we finish the public mm -hmm. hearing and have the motion, we can decide at that point. Okay. Uh, let's open the public hearing. Uh, Patrice, who do we have? Mr. Domain. Thank you, gentlemen, as we've talked about this in the planning. Let's, let's look a lot closer at uh, like a 90-foot lot. You know, a 90-foot lot, we're talking about a 10-foot setback times two. That's 20. And remember, we've got the overhangs to add. We're talking 22 feet off of the buildable property, okay? And now you're going to sit there and have at least 22 foot between each home. That's a bit excessive compared to where we have been, Okay. I don't, I don't disagree. I think possibly if you were to say, I think there's something that we need to, to work towards here. One is, can we take the overhang equation out of it to make it simpler for us to all to understand? That takes two feet out of the equation or allows a person to, to give a customer an 18-inch overhang if they desire. You go into some of the green building standards, they want more overhangs now. They're going back to that. We can't. Okay? Um, so let's look at, you know, if you look at an 80-foot lot and you're talking about a 10-foot setback, let's bring that down. We don't have to maybe go down to five, but at least bring it down to seven and a half with no overhang, without the overhang factor as a compromise. Uh, Ricky, <coughs> as a compromise, you know, as a possibility. <laughs> but, but when you look at your 70s and your 60s and your 50s, <coughs> you're taking that 70 and you've got seven and a half times two is 15, and plus two, we're talking now 17 feet off of 17. That's that 53-foot profile of a home. That architecturally is a challenge, okay? Because let's put this in, in the consequence, in, in, in the equation of this is Ascension Parish. How many customers do I have who said, if I could give a place to put my boat, put my RV, you know? We can't do it. Okay, but yet we're going to allow an accessory structure. I can't build a house 
All right, now watch this off the back of the house. <clears throat> I'm 20 feet plus one. I'm 20 feet to the back building line. Drainage is 15, right? Drainage one's 15. We don't, we don't require a rear lot drainage servitude anymore. Not in the subdivision. Oh, we took those away? We don't have culverts in the back of the subdivisions no more? No, we, we typically want them to send that water to the front. We don't want to maintain those rear lot ditches and subdivisions. We're putting culverts in. We've got catch bases like in Moss Point. How old is Moss Point? Five years. Okay. <laughs> and the customers aren't complaining because the yard's drain in the back. You know, most of the, if we don't have drainage in the backyard, if we don't have a culvert system in the backyard with catch bases, the water is not getting out of the backyard. And there's, a, there's a issues there, okay, especially with these smaller lots. So anyhow, so now we're going to take the accessory building, and I can go forward back as 10 and 5? Yes, sir. That's, that blows away the theory of the fire. Ricky, what about tying a formula where it's 10% of the lot width is the number? So if it's 110 feet, it's 11 and 11. 50 feet, 5 and 5, 70, 7 and 7. I'm okay with that. I, these are standards that I've increased in the hopes of not getting into this fight at the council meeting. So I knew that by increasing to this number that the person who argued with me about them wouldn't argue. So anything below that, yeah, we're going to have a discussion and it may get bumped back up, but that's where these numbers came from, from actual discussions with people who didn't like the narrow setbacks. I'm just offering a somewhere between too small to but maybe too big and it's a, an easy formula. Yeah. Well, let's, let's look at the, the 50 foot lot. If we got five and five, all right, because we are not allowing zero lot lines. Zero lot lines require us to put one hour firewall separation into the structure of the building. Okay, so we're away from that. So we just got clean buildings, nice overhangs. So if we're down to five and five, so we have some room there to work with. Um, we could do that. We could go to, you know, like I said, maybe six on a 70-foot lot or something like that. Maybe seven on an 80-foot lot is, is points that we could so work with. you don't like me 10%, huh? <laughs> yeah, I was trying to help you there. Yeah, you got to put, a, you gotta put a, spe a specific number. But I think that I think we can have some contention here as to why we're restricting the house, yet we could put up to a 1,000-square-foot accessory building, which a 1,000-square-foot we can't fit on one of these lots anyhow, plus the house. Uh, but how's that guy going to get to it, okay? And then, and then there we're crowding that backyard. So I think in East Baton Rouge, I'll say this. The accessory building has to follow the same. Ricky, correct me. I'm sorry. Correct me if I'm wrong. In East Baton Rouge Parish, in the guidelines, the accessory building follows the same building lines as the house. I, I don't know the answer to that. We see these buildings. You buy them at Home Depot. You buy them at Lowe's. You buy them at the highway store on 431. They take it off a truck and they put it in their backyard and they're in violation of their setbacks because they put them yeah. too close. Mm -hmm. And what we're trying to say is if that structure and you know most of these metal buildings are bigger than a thousand square feet so they wouldn't qualify for those reduced setbacks. We're talking Huge. about it is yeah. it's a big building and what we're saying is we would and if we want to reduce that square footage we can do that. We were trying to say if you want to have one of these buildings on your property and it's not a grainy flat it's not a, uh, it's a pool house, basically, is what we're talking about. Up to 1,000 square feet, you can reduce those setbacks. And I don't disagree. I mean, you have an outdoor kitchen as part of that building, and the thing bursts into flames, and you're five feet off the property line. Yeah, you, you're just going to have the same fire issue. We were trying to accommodate things that we see every day. People put those things in the rear setback, in the side setback, because they think, Oh, it's on skids, I'll just move it. Or, oh, you know, it's on blocks, I can just pick it up and move it if I need to. Or I'm going to take it with me when I move. Mm -hmm. I mean, every day. But then most of those are in violation of tighter subdivision requirements anyhow. And to build an accessory building, they want it to be the same building structure as the house. All right. So then would we allow that to be built to within 5 and 10? That's a question for the commission. And I have a question about the overhang, the, the one foot or one and a half or two foot. 
Where did that come from? It's in the code. Uh, we define a building, and the building is any part of the structure, and the overhang is considered a part of the building. And the building line is the building. And, and we, defi we define what a building is, is in, in the that's development code. The land's definition, or that's the Ascension Parish that's definition? A, that's the Ascension Parish okay. definition. All right. Okay. It's so it could thing. be changed. Yeah. No, yeah, yeah. So if we follow that, I think we should look at what we're proposing here, okay, as part of our equation, okay, without going back to, or we battle it on that issue. Thank you, gentlemen. Okay. All right. Any other cards, uh, Patrice? Okay. So we'll close the public hearing. And uh, then look at this, and um, we could we could One pass discussion. it as it is. We could we could uh, offer amendments. We could uh, just as a point of discussion. I kind of like Robert's idea about the percentage. Uh, it's more consistent that it, way. Huh? Yeah, I think that it would affect each individual uh, housing type on an equal basis, and it does lower the numbers. Uh, well, why don't we, if we do that, let's stipulate the feet rather than the percentage and just go by the percentage if you're going to do that. In other words, make the H housing type five feet on either side, not 10%. But base it on the 10%. Right. Well, what would happen then if, if they wanted to do that 54 foot or that 63 foot? Which would it go up to the next to level? The next no, we would default to the more lenient setback. Mm -hmm. Round down. Round yes. Down. If you're a 59-foot lot, you adhere to the 50-foot setback. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. What about the overhang thing? Is this something that's worth toying around? I mean, is that something that you're going to hear a lot of pushback on? Think? I think the pushback you're going to get is from Laverne. Right. Um, that's what I'm asking. But the standard, as I've always understood it, you're measuring to the foundation. Um, if we started measuring setbacks to the foundation rather than the eave, I think we would want to define how much eave we're going to allow to poke into our five-foot side setbacks mm -hmm. because you got a five-foot side setback with a two-foot eave. Yeah. Now your buildings are only six feet right. apart. That's right. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. I, would, I don't know if I'd want, I'd want to change both of them, lowering the numbers and, and doing away with the eave. Or I think you might know two different sides there. We need to concentrate on one side of it if we're going to make a change. I would think anyway. I'd be interested in both, yeah. I think. Other right. discussion? Say that again. Would you speak to the amendment? No, I'm, I'm saying what uh, kind of, you know, in opposition to what Paul was saying. I think I'd be interested in both, taking the eve, eaves out of the equation as well as doing the percentage, you know, doing eight foot on an 80 foot lot and, and taking the eaves out of the equation. <coughs> Going with the smaller setbacks and taking the eave out. Measuring to the slab. Well, we, if we. We go that route. We present. Let the council change it back, as Ricky said. Right. 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 Well, should we that would come as a amendment? separate right. item. We would have to amend the development code definition section. Right. Mm -hmm. So that can't that be done tonight. To right. Okay. If we want to do that, we'll put that on the agenda under the staff report for next month. We'll show you what the idea is that you guys are discussing, and we'll request the public hearing for November. Maybe bring some standards from other places. We can do that. Yeah. Okay. In the in the meantime. Should we define, we're lowering, lowering the number, should we go with what you said to limit the amount of overhang as part of this? No, because right now we're still going to measure based From on. Overhang. Okay, got it. Okay. If we bring that forward, we may amend the development tables at that time to, to add that to it. Okay. I kind of like yeah. uh, Gasper's modification of Robert's uh, <laughs> yeah. same idea. Yeah. Yeah. Ten percent, well, but the state of the yeah. 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 Okay. Uh, any other suggestions as far as possible changes to the table? Okay. So, uh, do I hear a motion? Probably could if anybody could figure out what it was. <laughs> I, I recommend a, approval of the ordinance with the change that it is the offset on side yard is equivalent or less of 10% of the lot's width, as defined by Ricky. 
and that's of the base housing type. So, yeah, that, for right. example, <laughs> the the uh, G housing type is a 50, but if somebody wants to build a 58, they're still going to meet the G housing type setbacks, mm -hmm. and that'll be five foot sides because it's a 50 right. foot lot. 10% mm -hmm. yeah. of 50. Okay, so, so if somebody can write that up. I got it. Uh, it's that's fine. That's <laughs> and I'll right. second that one. Right. So uh, Ms. Lizo seconds. Any other discussion? Uh, any opposition? That motion carries, and that will be recommended to the council as well. Uh, item number eight, staff report. Yeah, Mr. Frost. Two. Yeah, that's me. Uh, we have two, but the first one, uh, I think it's in the handout, deals with uh, advertising signs, like Lamar signs, those type of things. Uh, basically, this deals with, with properties, I'm going to use, for example, Highway 42, in which they are widening 42, and when they, widen, when they will be widening 42, they will be taking some of these signs down. But what's happened is that that property has been rezoned since those signs have been put up. That zoning district is now MU2, which we do not allow uh, billboard signs. So basically what we're asking is to, is to make an exception that, that if these things occur, meaning that if there's a taking, if there's a widening and your property is zoned mixed use 2, you're allowed to place that sign on the same not on the same property, but adjacent property, and it and and if they're double stacked, they're not going to be double stacked. There's standards to it, uh, to those standards of what they can put back on those properties. They will not be allowed to put more. There, whatever was there, it would be allowed. So basically, what it is is that yes, Grandfather. yes, sir. But we're writing a, a standard for that if that situation, yeah, that replacement, if that occurs, this is what the the code or this is what the standard is. And that yes. will happen in our lifetimes, the, the widening of 42? <laughs> well, yeah, I think you saw in the paper, I think they pushed it back pushed again. Back. Yes. Yeah. Although the only problem with that I can see is like if the property owner has, for instance, a lease with Correct. Lamar saying yes. that it will be a double sign and then you can only put the single sign back, then does it void that landowner's lease? No, we've met with Lamar and they're comfortable with this standard. So I'm not going to say that there may be other ones out there, but yeah. they're stating they don't like those double stack signs. Uh, they basically bought those from other companies, and they have no problem bringing them back down to single. So is, is that the only sign vendor Lamar? That's the, the only one I, I know of in that area. I can't say that there's other ones, uh, but if there are, they're very they're the small ones. They're not large signs. Okay. And remember, this is just just dealing with advertising signs. Mm -hmm. you know billboards, those type of things, not not commercial, on-site, you know, business signs. So what would that require us to do as a zoning commission? Basically coming up or having an ordinance to, to put in place that when this does occur, that these are the standards that are going to apply when when this happens. Basically a taking, I guess you could say, when there's a widening of some sort. The only place I could see this actually occurring again to, would possibly be Highway 44 if that ever gets widened. Other places, they either not allowed or, you know, or, or the state or those properties are in a, in a residential district. Mm -hmm. And then remember, this is just an MU2 districts. Yeah, so we are requesting a public hearing at the next meeting. <coughs> okay. What's your pleasure, gentlemen? Move that we have a public hearing. Okay, good. <laughs> I want some more of this. <laughs> All right. Mr. Bishop moves. Uh, Mr. Uh, Burgess seconds. Any objection? Okay, well, let's, let's have a public hearing then uh, next month as well. And you have another item? Yes, sir, we do have another item. Um, this, dealing, this deals with RV for tourists. Uh, basically, the code states that you're allowed to do RV for tourists, but they're in districts that are basically and rural and conservation. And we've been getting a lot of phone calls dealing with RV parks. And we don't define what a tourist is. So I went through and looked at other communities, and I think you have some things in your handout to define what that is. They define it by time frame. The only problem that I see with that, like anything else, is going to be an enforcement. How long do we know that those people are actually going to be there without going, you know, every day or every, every week to look at that? So basically, I guess at this point, asking for a public hearing for the, at the next meeting. Do we just want to take that 
out of the code, meaning that at this point, just allow RV parks in the commercial districts, the same place where we allow uh, mobile home parks, or do we want to get involved with start, you know, defining what a tourist is? And can we put garage sales in that ordinance? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Let's do a permit. You know, there's, um, if you go down the river, where, where, wherever there's new plant construction, these guys that are building the plants are in RVs from all over the country, and they stay there for the duration. Right. I mean, they, they basically live there until they're done and they move on. You know, we are getting, on average, two calls a week, people that want to build an RV park. And right now we tell them you have to build an RV park in commercial zoning categories. You've got to pave the roads. You've got to do all these things. Well, this, I'm not going to call it a loophole, but it's what it is because we don't define what a travel trailer park for tourists is. But it says you can do it in rural and conservation zoning. So literally, we could have hundreds, if not thousands, of RVs in our rural and conservation zoning categories, and we wouldn't be able to, how do you, what's a tourist? What does that mean? We think that it's a KOA campground. It's that kind of thing. It's it was designed with recreation amenities where somebody comes in and parks for a weekend and then leaves. That's a commercial operation. I just don't know that Ascension Parish needs to be in that business right now of monitoring where do you think these requests are coming from, and who wants to do, build these things? Landowners who know that there's a lot of people with RVs who need places to park. Well, RVs to park not as tourists, but because they're going to be here for years building things. Okay. Yes, correct. Right. Yeah. It's going to be our recommendation to eliminate it from the code so that we don't have to monitor or figure out how to monitor tourists until such time that maybe somebody comes to us and says, hey, I want to do a KOA campground, and then we go, okay, let's figure out how to do that. Mm -hmm. But to just have to guess which person is doing a tourist campground versus a non-tourist resident campground. Mm -hmm. Do RVs for tourists pay the hotel motel tax? Because if they do, whoever the tax collecting authority would have to monitor, monitor the income. But even then, they, they, they could have a long-term so. renter who would pay that tax, and you'd have the same problem. Uh, so if someone legitimately wanted to have a um, an RV park that was for tourists, they would have to follow the standards of the, uh, the, the permanent. What we RV. would do for that person is probably walk them through the PUD or SPUD process. So to do a rezoning. Correct. Okay. And so we'd have a lot of oversight there. Okay. If that was a legitimate request. Mm -hmm. So at this point, it's just been a lot of requests. No, no one has actually opened any of these. No, sir. They, they've been asking if they can, and we've been misdirecting and playing, you know, the zone defense. Okay, Reggie, I, I don't think the, the general public would would really be happy with us if we turn the rural areas into parks for. Uh, living quarters, let's say. Well, and it could be because St. James Parish has put a moratorium on them, so the people that wanted to put them in St. That's James would have to come yeah. And that's why, I, yeah, I would be in favor of removal. So we need a public hearing for that? Yeah. Yes, sir. Okay. Yeah, so we'll put that on. Uh, we need to have on the agenda. Mr. Burgess, second by Mr. Bishop. Any objection? Mm -mm. Okay, so we'll have that on the agenda next month as well. Yes, sir. Okay, so you're going to bring refreshments next month? Oh, yeah. <laughs> a hot dog or two. You, uh, you might want to get those old doors. <laughs> yeah. Okay, that uh, <coughs> the agenda. Anything else on the staff report? No, sir. That's okay, it. thank you. Thank you. That brings us to agenda item number nine, adjourn. Motion. Okay, second. Adjourn. Thank you.